Scientists from the Korean Institute of Science and Technology have announced a groundbreaking discovery that could significantly improve our lives in the near future. They claim to have achieved a substance with superconducting properties at even higher temperatures, which could be a game changer. The material, known as LK99, is a copper dope lead appetite with a chemical formula like this. It becomes a superconductor at just 127 degrees Celsius, and remarkably, it does so even under normal pressure. This means it's essentially a superconductive material without the need for additional efforts or complex technological processes to manufacture. It's produced by heating lead oxide sulfate and copper sulfide at 925 degrees Celsius under high vacuum conditions. As of now, the findings are in preprint form and have not yet undergone independent peer review. Other researchers have yet to replicate the Korean scientists' experiments, so it's premature to definitively claim this discovery. Nevertheless, the potential implications of LK99, if it lives up to expectations, are truly remarkable. But before we delve into what the Koreans have supposedly invented, let's first understand the concept of superconductivity and how it's achieved. Then, we'll discuss the current applications of superconducting materials and how room temperature superconductors might revolutionize modern technology. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Superconductivity is the phenomenon where a conductor loses its electrical resistance under certain conditions. One of the main factors in achieving this, or perhaps it's better to say, Historically achieving this, involves cooling the material to extremely low temperatures. To understand this better, let's take a moment to talk about the origin of electrical resistance. Electric current, by definition, is the directed movement of charged particles under the influence of an electric field. In metallic conductors, these charged particles are free electrons, collectively referred to as an electron gas, which flows between the metal ions comprising the crystal lattice. However, electrons don't move in an orderly fashion along set paths between the ions. In addition to their directed movement in response to the electric field, electrons also engage in chaotic thermal motion, which results in their actual trajectories resembling intricate zigzag lines. Moreover, this chaotic movement plays a far greater role in electrons' lives than their directed movement under the electric field. While the thermal motion of electrons in a metal can reach speeds of hundreds to thousands of meters per second, the directed movement, also called drift velocity, under the electric field amounts to only fractions of a millimeter per second. In other words, the kinetic energy of electrons due to their movement in the electric field typically makes up a negligible portion of their overall kinetic energy, which mainly results from their participation in random thermal motion. Additionally, the ions that form the crystal lattice also partake in thermal motion. They don't stay fixed in their lattice positions. Instead, they oscillate around these points within quite broad limits. Thus, in reality, the flow of electric current through a conductor doesn't resemble neat rows of disciplined electrons marching between neatly arranged layers of ion columns. Electrons, in their movement through a conductor, continually collide with both ions and each other. In this process, the kinetic energy of the drift motion of electrons constantly diminishes, while the energy of their chaotic thermal motion increases. In simpler terms, due to the presence of electrical resistance in the conductor, the current weakens, but in return, the temperature rises. Both outcomes are undesirable. We found a practical application for the second phenomenon. This is precisely how we heat up heating coils in electric kettles, toasters, and space heaters. However, in most cases, we have no reason to heat up conductors, especially considering that as temperature rises, the thermal motion of particles intensifies, resulting in increased resistance. High energy consumers often heat up so much that we have to put in extra effort to cool them down. Yes, those coolers on computers and powerful graphics cards consume additional energy to mitigate the thermal consequences of electrical resistance in materials. Moreover, the losses of electrical energy in power grids are significant, up to 30% of the total generated electricity. To be fair, not all these losses are due to electrical resistance, there are other mechanisms at play, but we'll discuss those another time. Today, our focus is on superconductivity. So, Here's the phenomenon where the electrical resistance of a conductor drops to zero under certain conditions, not nearly zero, but precisely zero. But how is this possible? It's not hard to understand why resistance decreases when a conductor is cooled. The lower the temperature, the more ordered the particle movement becomes. They adhere more closely to the rules of the road and collide with each other less frequently, resulting in fewer energy losses. However, these losses cannot completely disappear, especially at temperatures significantly above absolute zero. For example, lead becomes superconducting at 7 Kelvin, and the explanation for how this happens lies in quantum physics. Let's be clear, the theory of superconductivity is quite complex. Here, we'll present a highly simplified version for a general understanding. 
consider the microscopic structure of a conductor, but this time at very low temperatures. Both ions and electrons inside the conductor continue to move chaotically, but the speed of this motion is low, making the pattern far more orderly compared to what we saw earlier. Let's examine the behavior of an individual electron in this system and its ion environment. Negatively charged electrons and positively charged ions attract each other. The attraction force acting on the electron from the ions is balanced, but the force with which the electron acts on the ions is not. As a result, ions near the electron start getting pulled towards it, moving closer together. At a certain point, this process will be halted by the increasing repulsion force between the positively charged ions. Yet, near the electron in the metal, an area will emerge where the density of positive charge is higher than in the rest of the material. And if the electron moves, this region of increased charge density will shift along with it, as if a positively charged particle were traveling through the material. In reality, of course, no such particle exists. Nonetheless, everything happens as if it were, and calculating these processes is more convenient if we pretend this particle exists. This imaginary particle is known in condensed matter physics as a polarin. At high temperatures, this effect also occurs, but the displacement of ions caused by an electron will be nearly imperceptible against the backdrop of the ion's thermal vibrations themselves. For this effect to become significant, the temperature must be extremely low. Now, let's consider another electron located somewhere nearby within the crystal. With its negative charge, it will naturally repel the first electron. However, at the same time, it will be attracted to the region of increased positive charge density. It turns out that the attraction force outweighs the repulsion force. Although the electrons will still repel each other, within the lattice, they behave as if they're attracted to each other. In other words, the first electron attracts a positively charged polarin to itself, and the polarin, in turn, draws a negatively charged electron towards itself. Thus, this entire interplay moves forward in unison. Such a system of two electrons bound together through the disturbance of the lattice ion density is called a Cooper pair. Since there is attraction, albeit mediated, between the particles and the pair, it requires some energy to separate one of the electrons from the pair. Now, let's introduce an external electric field. Under its influence, both electrons will shift within the lattice, resulting in an electric current. In this case, the carriers of the current are not individual electrons but Cooper pairs, and this is where the most intriguing part begins. Even at such low temperatures, where both electrons and ions partake in chaotic thermal motion, they theoretically should collide with each other, and the material should exhibit resistance. However, let's examine what happens when one of the electrons in the pair collides with an ion. It's evident that the electron must deviate from its trajectory and move away, breaking its connection with its partner. But, as mentioned earlier, breaking a Cooper pair requires a certain amount of energy. Interestingly, at very low temperatures, the kinetic energy of the particles may be insufficient to sever this connection. In other words, the process of breaking a Cooper pair, which inevitably follows the collision of one of the electrons with an ion, becomes energetically impossible. And in quantum mechanics, energetically impossible processes do not occur. And from a classical standpoint, if we consider Cooper pairs of electrons, they should, at least occasionally, collide with ions. However, in the realm of quantum reality, this doesn't happen. Electrons seem to magically avoid the oscillating ions, circumventing collisions. The energy of electron drift ceases to transfer to the ions, electrical resistance disappears, and a state of superconductivity emerges. However, a Cooper pair can still break apart if an electric field imparts a sufficiently high drift velocity to the electrons, making their kinetic energy substantial. Collisions become energetically possible and start occurring. Electrical resistance returns. Even at very low temperatures, the state of superconductivity can be disrupted if a sufficiently large current is passed through the conductor. Yet, as we discussed earlier, the speed and consequently the kinetic energy of electron drift are much smaller than the kinetic energy of their thermal motion. Thus, in practice, even at significant currents, electron velocity won't be exceptionally high, and the superconductor can withstand it. Of course, this is a highly simplified and approximate illustration of the superconductivity process. In reality, things are much more fascinating and complex. Firstly, it turns out that the strength of Cooper attraction between electrons is maximized when these electrons move in opposite directions. Surprisingly, this attraction force decreases with distance. This implies that Cooper pairs aren't something stationary, they continually form and break apart as they move relative to each other. However, each electron that breaks away from a pair immediately forms a pair with another electron, and the total number of pairs remains constant. By the way, 
This is why superconductors don't fare well in strong magnetic fields. Such a field will pull electrons of a moving Cooper pair in opposite directions, and if the field is strong enough, this effect will surpass the attraction between the pair's electrons, leading to its breakup and consequently disrupting superconductivity. Secondly, Cooper pairs consist of electrons whose spin projections along an axis perpendicular to the direction of movement are opposite to each other. This arrangement maximizes the Cooper attraction. Electrons have a spin of half, making them fermions, whereas a Cooper pair comprising two electrons with opposite spins has a total spin of zero, classifying it as a boson. Fermions cannot occupy the same energy state, whereas bosons, such as Cooper pairs, not only can, but they even prefer to be in the same state. Hence, in a strongly cooled conductor, a multitude of Cooper pairs tends to be in a state of the lowest possible energy, a state known as the Bose-Einstein condensate, or a Bose gas. As these particles will have the same and minimal possible energy, they cannot collide with each other. In such collisions, particles would need to exchange energy, which implies that the energy of one particle would decrease while the others increases. However, the minimal energy cannot drop any further. This is why a highly cooled conductor no longer resists the flow of electric current through it. Imagine a circuit made of superconductor material in which we've initiated an electric current. This current will circulate through the circuit without attenuation, even after the initiating influence disappears. Experiments have recorded the independent flow of current in a superconductor without decay for several years. The theory of superconductivity in metals, a simplified version of which we discussed earlier, is known as the BCS, barton cooper schreffer theory. Unfortunately, it only works at very low temperatures, typically no more than 20 degrees above absolute zero. According to this theory, superconductivity at higher temperatures is considered impossible, and for a long time, it was believed to be the case. This was quite disheartening because cooling metals to such low temperatures is a cumbersome and costly process. However, in the 1980s, materials with superconductivity at much higher temperatures were discovered. These included compounds with substantial resistance under normal conditions, such as copper oxides, also known as cuprates, or magnesium diboride, which becomes a superconductor at 39 Kelvin or minus 234 degrees Celsius. In 1987, one type of cuprate, yttrium barium copper oxide, exhibited superconductivity at 92 Kelvin or minus 181 degrees Celsius. This marked a revolution in superconducting technology, as these conductors could be cooled using liquid nitrogen, which is significantly cheaper than the liquid helium used to cool low-temperature superconductors. It's worth mentioning superconductors based on hydrogen compounds, which exhibit superconductivity at relatively high temperatures but under high pressures. For instance, regular hydrogen sulfide becomes a superconductor at minus 70 degrees Celsius but at an immense pressure of around 1 million atmospheres. In the case of sulfur carbon superhydrides, so-called CSH compounds, superconductivity supposedly emerges at 15 degrees Celsius and pressures of over 2.5 million atmospheres. However, there are substantial doubts about whether errors might have crept into the experiments involving superhydrides. All of this was remarkable. But one unpleasant problem arose, the superconductivity of these substances could no longer be explained by the BCS theory. In cuprates and similar structures, as well as in other types of high-temperature superconductors, Cooper pairs shouldn't have formed at such high temperatures according to this theory, or they shouldn't have formed at all. A comprehensive theory of high-temperature superconductivity has eluded physicists to this day. It's clear that Cooper pairs also form within high-temperature superconductors. However, how they form and what they consist of remains unclear. Most high-temperature superconductors, including the material LK99 we started our discussion with, possess a layered structure. For instance, the aforementioned yttrium barium copper oxide consists of layers of copper oxide alternating with layers of barium oxide and yttrium. We have experimentally determined that superconductivity occurs within the layers of copper oxide, which conducts electricity relatively poorly under normal conditions. Copper oxide forms due to the sharing of valence electrons from copper atoms, which occupy the vacant orbitals on the 2p sublevel of oxygen atoms. Since electrons are fermions, each orbital can accommodate a maximum of two electrons, with opposite spins. As a result, the spins and magnetic moments of valence electrons in neighboring copper atoms must be oriented in opposite directions. This orientation is termed antiferromagnetic. In such a structure, there are no free charge carriers, and it seems that there isn't a basis for Cooper pairs to form. However, this is where we need to recall that our material also contains barium and yttrium atoms situated above and below the copper layer. These atoms can play a role similar to impurity atoms in semiconductors. They can break the symmetry of the main layer, either by adding electrons to it, making them donors, or by taking electrons from it, making them acceptors. 
Let's assume we have an acceptor mechanism, where external atoms snatch one of the lattice electrons. This creates a vacant spot, and the atom that lost the electron gains a positive charge. Thanks to this, under the influence of external forces like an electric field, an electron from another atom can jump into the vacant spot. The atom that was originally robbed becomes neutral again, but now a different atom gains a positive charge, and another electron from another atom can jump to it under the field's influence. This will appear as if a positively charged particle, a so-called hole, is traveling through the material. Now, let's examine the behavior of several such holes in our material, which, as a reminder, generally exhibits an antiferromagnetic orientation. These holes disrupt the antiferromagnetic structure, and it turns out that the energy of this disturbance is lower the closer the holes are to each other. In other words, the holes will start attracting each other, much like free electrons in a metal, but this time due to magnetic rather than electric forces. This magnetic attraction is one of the proposed mechanisms for the formation of Cooper pairs from holes in high temperature superconductors, whose conducting layer possesses antiferromagnetic properties, like cup rates and other compounds. The second possible mechanism involves the interaction of holes with stolen electrons. Having opposite charges, they will naturally attract each other, so it's quite possible that they can also form Cooper pairs, leading to the emergence of superconductivity. Since in condensed matter physics, a quasi-particle consisting of an electron and a hole is called an exciton, this mechanism of superconductivity is referred to as excitonic. Moreover, positive charged holes, as well as electrons, could still influence the metallic lattice of the conducting layer through a donor mechanism in the external layers. This interaction could cause positive copper ions to repel and negative oxygen ions to attract each other. This could lead to the anomaly of charge density and attraction between similarly charged carriers, similar to what we observed in metals, but potentially stronger. In this scenario, it's even possible for two particles to become truly bound to each other and move together as a more or less stable quasi-particle known as a bipolarin, essentially representing that same Cooper pair and capable of enabling superconductivity. I want to emphasize that we are discussing a very rough and approximate description of possible mechanisms for high temperature superconductivity. There are other more intricate theories regarding how it could form. Moreover, high temperature superconductivity doesn't necessarily have to arise from a single mechanism. It's entirely possible that various mechanisms have some influence on what's happening, and in different materials, their contributions to superconductivity are likely to vary. As I mentioned before, we certainly don't know for sure yet, although we do have some basic ideas about what a prospective superconductor might look like, what atoms it should consist of, and how those atoms should be arranged relative to each other. While theorists work on creating a complete theory of high temperature superconductivity, experimenters, based on the foundational concepts we've discussed, are practically constructing new materials that theoretically could possess superior superconducting properties. And if the message from the Korean University of Science and Technology turns out to be true, we'll find ourselves in quite an unusual situation for modern science. We'll have a device that works, yet we won't fully understand how it works. While this may not be the most pleasant development for theorists, there's no need for us to be disheartened here. On the contrary, the emergence of room temperature superconductors would be a true breakthrough, capable of significantly improving our lives in many ways. The most obvious consequence, using superconducting wires, will be able to avoid losses during current transmission and electrical grids, which will significantly save electricity. Moreover, superconducting power lines can transmit much more electricity through the circuit with lower voltage. For instance, a 20 kV superconducting line could transmit the same power as a regular 110 kV line. What's also significant is that these lines can be laid underground, eliminating the need for bulky and expensive overhead lines. Microelectronics will also experience vast prospects since the power of microelectronics today is largely limited by the necessity to cool electronic circuits. Superconducting wire coils can become not only powerful magnets like those used today, say, in magnetic resonance imaging machines, but also efficient energy storage devices. Indeed, if we somehow inject energy from an electric current into a superconductor, it will store that energy for a long time without losses. Today, superconducting energy storage systems are employed in power grids, storing energy during low consumption hours and releasing it during peak demand hours. However, due to the need to constantly cool these devices to ultra-low temperatures, they are currently massive and expensive constructions. By using room temperature superconductors, we could create smaller superconducting energy storage units with larger capacities, faster charging speeds, and higher reliability. And while you probably won't power your mobile phone from such a source, in the field of electric vehicle manufacturing and electrified transportation, this could truly spark a revolution. And of course, maglev trains, how can we forget them? Thanks to the Meissner effect, 
which we'll discuss in more detail in a separate video if you're interested. A superconductor can levitate in the presence of a permanent magnet, or conversely, a permanent magnet can levitate above a superconductor. While maglev trains today are generally an expensive novelty in the realm of passenger transport, room temperature superconductors will fundamentally change the rules of the game in long-distance rail freight transport. Freight maglev trains could travel thousands of kilometers without experiencing wear on a wheelbase since they won't have any wheelbase to begin with, the train will simply hover above the tracks. Last but not least, quantum computers utilizing superconducting cells as a key element of their design. However, what quantum computers are, why they are needed, how they function, and how superconductors are utilized within them will be more thoroughly explained in a separate video. So, be sure to subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss out on anything interesting.